Danielle Cooley for joining us. She started her own research business 13 years ago. Her background, her major in Vanderbilt was engineering. Um, after that, she did a master's degree at Bentley and she still teaches at uh, Northeastern. Um, worked for a number of great companies before she went freelance. FedEx, uh, Fidelity Investments. <laughs> I do this by memory, I can't quite remember. Um, but then at, in 2013, set up DG Cooley and Company and went solo. So she's been doing this for nine years. So I thought she would be an awesome person to tell you why she did it, how she did it, and maybe any tips that she has for you on, you know, on how to do it. So, okay. <laughs> so, so quick correction there. I did start the practice in 2009. So I have been doing it for 13 years. So you, you said both. The first one was correct. Um, no worries. And man, I started it. So the great story is that I had been thinking about going out on my own um, because I worked in a consulting company and realized that, you know, they had a lot of overhead. They had a lot of non-billable people just keeping things running. And the end client was paying for that. And of course, the work they were getting out of it was the same as if they just hired me directly. So I thought, well, I could make more money and they could save some money and get the same results. Um, and so th that was the thought process. And then I had my first son and figured I'll just chill on that for a few little while, you know, see how that goes. And two hours after I got back from maternity leave, I was a part of a layoff. So I said, oh, I guess I'm an independent consultant now. And I have been ever since. And the joke is that uh, my son is my mandatory white male co-founder. So <laughs> he's 13. Hopefully I can put him to work soon. He can start earning some of that cred. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you about it. I enjoy it. I uh, have not yet found an in-house position compelling enough to pull me away um, in 13 years. So mostly, I guess I would just love to answer any questions you have and, and learn more about you and why you're here. Well, Danielle, I want to just point out the first thing, which is so often people go into freelance inadvertently. It's where right, they aren't planning it and then choose the day. And then it just life events intervene mm -hmm. and and that sort of pushes you out of the comfortable guaranteed work and salary world and it's sink, sink or swim <laughs> it is uh, which is a nice segue into the safety net right that's always the big question is can i do this how risky is it you know i had a spouse who had group health insurance and a magical paycheck that dropped from the sky every two weeks and that was very helpful. Um, you know, we lived in a low cost of living area. We didn't, you know, we weren't going to lose our house or anything if I didn't find work right away. So uh, that was important. And I would say if I didn't have that, uh, I, I probably would not have become an independent consultant at that point. I would have needed more stability and, and predictability um, until I could build up more of a safety net of my own right, to do that kind of thing, um, because it, it does also cost more than you think it will. <laughs> At least it did to me. I mean, people warn you about self-employment tax, but it's really high. And, um, you know, then you just do spend a lot of non-billable time, you know, finding the work and doing the proposals and doing the contracts and, you know, um, handling administrative duties. So it's, it's not easy, but I think it's worth it. And it gets easier, right? Because then you get practice at all those things. Okay, that's a good point too. All right, well, I'm hoping we have some questions. So please uh, step forward if you've got a question, Daniel. 
Hi, Danielle. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name's Fee. I have my question for you is I've heard that, and I just I'm just curious to hear your take. Sometimes people say freelancers should bill. You you talked about like non billable hours, etc. So I'm wondering. Yeah, sometimes people say, oh, you should bill by the hour versus bill by the type of project. So what's your kind of take on that and like does it matter is it a personal choice is there like one way UX researchers should be so there's a lot that goes into that that's a great question Fane. um I prefer to work on a fixed fee basis where there is a project with a start and a finish and a def- well-defined scope and outcome um and I what you don't get when you bill hourly is uh, really capturing the value of the knowledge that you provide, right? Uh, So as a researcher, I provide these clients with amazing insights that affect their product designs that ultimately go on to affect their bottom lines in very big ways. Uh, And because I'm so experienced, I can do that pretty quickly, right? So if I build hourly uh, for projects like that, I would I would need to have a pretty exorbitant hourly rate really to, to make that happen. Um, but framing it more around the value of the information and the knowledge and the insights really helps, I think, to maximize um, their impression of the, the overall effort, and, you know, to understand that the work we're doing is important and valuable, um, honestly, to help the insights move into production instead of going into a drawer, uh, right? Um, That said, there are certain situations where billing hourly just makes more sense, right? Like if the scope is not very well-defined and it's just like, hey, we're gonna try to figure out what we wanna learn and what we wanna do. And we're not really sure what that's gonna be. And it might be this many, you know, it might be, six studies or it might be one study and we just don't know yet. And I'm like, okay, well, I can help you figure that out. We can, you know, have some sort of a retainer agreement or just a pure hourly agreement. Um, I also sometimes subcontract for other consulting practices and that tends to work out better hourly if only because they bill hourly, right? So that helps them do the math and figure out whether they can afford me, you know, to participate in the project. But generally, I absolutely advocate for um, fixed fee value-based pricing. <laughs> um, what, what kind of contracts are you getting? Um, like what kind of activities are you doing? I'm a big fan of the fixed fee. Um, um, I, 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 haven't, I haven't been doing the freelance stuff in a while. I've, I've kind of been out of the game for a bit. So what kind of projects are you finding out there? And are you an LLC and why did you go that route? I am an LLC and I went that route because my accountant just sort of said, that's the easiest, let's do it. Uh, I do think that is not the right structure for me and I would like to change it, but that seems, you know, I just got a lot of momentum going. I've got some, uh, I'm a certified woman owned business and it's like changing the paperwork causes this cascade of other things that need to change. Um, but it may be costing me a lot of money, so I should probably figure that out. Uh, in terms of the types of projects that come up, it does vary a lot. So last, I guess it was actually 2020, uh, I did a large fixed fee project for the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis and they were redesigning actually their whole site, but what they were looking for my help with was the navigation structure. And did we need to sort of reconsider the information architecture and navigation structure of the site? So uh, I proposed, uh, we ended up, you know, I, what I proposed for an ideal situation was way outside of their budget. Uh, that of course they didn't disclose until they said, hey, that's way outside of our budget. How, how much can you do for this much? And so we agreed on um, one to two card sorting studies, one to two tree tests to validate what came out of those card sorting studies, and then one to two 
um, they called them click tests. They were basically usability studies of the prototypes that came out of those uh, NAV studies. Um, and, you know, did that. Uh, I'm also engaged now with a large healthcare client who I have done fixed fee work for in the past, but uh, right now I'm working with them just hourly to help, uh, I, I don't know, corral cats in the, <laughs> their, um, a, a variety of projects that they kind of have going all at the same time. So, and that is also for their public facing site, but it's more transactional stuff. So like how to schedule an appointment um, and then some information architecture, things like finding a doctor or uh, finding an urgent care center near you, things like that. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, if you weren't an LLC, what, you know, what are some of the alternatives that um, you've been considering? Sure. So I'm not a money person. I'm not an accountant. I'm not a small business financial advisor. Um, but my understanding is that organizing as an S corp would uh, give me tax benefits that I'm not currently realizing. However, I do think there's also a thing where you can have an LLC like tax as an S corp, but you, yeah, like right, right knows. Um, but you have to take regular uh, owner drawings and like pay yourself a salary. And right now I don't do that. I just kind of keep all the money in the business until like I have cash flow problems personally. And then I move a chunk of money over which only happens a couple of times a year. Um, otherwise I just kind of keep that going. Finance people would, would just like be horrified. <laughs> Can you talk more about how you uh, determine your, your pricing based on the value it, it provides to the business? How do you, what is your process for determining the value to the business so that you know how to build? That's a great question. And it just varies a lot. I mean, I do start with thinking about, you know, what's my typical hourly rate, right? Like it, it, I have, you know, my hourly rate, I have a subcontracting rate that's a little lower and thinking about in general, because those are the defined scope projects, right? So I can say, we're going to do this study, this study, and this study with these parameters. I know about how long that's going to take. I know about how much the expenses are going to be. I know, um, you know, how many more people I need to bring in if I need a, like a note taker or a second moderator or more than that. Um, so I'll start with that number and see where that lands me. And, um, but also it's sort of, what is the project? You know, is it something that's going to be directly tied to their revenue? And if so, is that, what is that revenue sort of likely to be, right? If it's a very large e-commerce company, then they're going to, uh, it, you know, I can improve their conversion rate by half a percent, you know, that's going to be many tens of millions of dollars for them, right, in a year. Um, if it's the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, they don't really have revenue, right? So <laughs> it's more of uh, what's it worth it to me? How much am I willing to squeeze into this dollar amount that they um, are looking for, you know, and that will get them to where they need to be, right? Uh, I'm not going to say, okay, well, that's good for two card sorting studies because that doesn't, they can't do anything with that. They're not researchers or designers. So I did need to get them to a nav structure at the end. Um, does that help at all? I mean, some of it's like, how deep are their pockets? Frankly, it's, you know, startups aren't going to have any money. Big corporations are generally going to have more, but not necessarily. And often when you're at the beginning of the proposal stages, you can just say, hey, what's your budget for this? And often they'll just tell you and, and you can scope that way. Thank you. Sure. Um, Armando, you raised your hand. Yes, I did. Um, this is an interesting topic. You're going into, you know, the, the rates, et cetera. And you know, some of us live in the East Coast, some in the West Coast, and I think there are large differences uh, geographically. Um, yes. I was wondering if you have a recommended source 
for vetting uh, sort of like going rates in different geographies for researchers of various experience levels. I know that there is something called salary.com, but I don't know if it's something that's like, if there's something else that I don't know about, something better or some other better suggestion to do self-assess. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so my general guideline, so this is just a, a point with a, a wide range on either end of it, is to take um, the salary you would be worth right? And maybe you're underpaid now um, and divide that by a thousand. So just for easy math, let's say you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, your bill rate would be a hundred dollars an hour and, exactly. and 200,000, your bill rate would be $200 an hour. Um, that, you know, you may need to be willing to negotiate that if you have a really large project, maybe you're willing to take a little less per hour. Um, then you need to sort of work in some guarantees, right? I've definitely talked to consultants who lowered their rate and then the project got canceled three weeks in. And so they ended up, you know, the reason they lowered their rate was because it was going to be, you know, 20 weeks of guaranteed work and, and it didn't turn out to be. Um, but that's a, just a good ballpark estimate. Okay. Um, and right. a lot of people come back with, yeah, but I work for 2000 hours for an employer but they're paying your employment tax, they're paying your part of your health benefits, um, they're <laughs> covering your tech support, you know, that you have to do yourself, all that admin stuff that you've got to take care of. Um, and oh, there was one more thing I was going to add about that. Oh, that does cover your geography a little bit more, right? So if you are in um, certainly the Bay Area, New York, Boston, the salary that you would be commanding in those places would be different than if you're in like Lincoln, Nebraska, right? So that's a good baseline to compare with uh, posted jobs and the going salaries on websites like salary.com and then say, okay, if that's what they're offering for a senior, you know, quality researcher at Facebook, for example, mm -hmm. I, would, I, could, I could do my math, you know, kind of thing. Yes. And I think, you know, depending on who the client is, you can kind of look at comparable companies. Facebook pays very well because uh, they have to really compete for that top talent and being in the Bay Area before everything went remote, they really have to do that. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it looks like someone put something in the chat to help with that. I'll be looking at that later. Anything else? I have a question. Yes. If you knew you were going to go into freelancing while you were in your full-time role uh, and you knew it was a definite thing, knowing what you know now about the work you do, is there anything you would have tried to do more of or learn more of while you were in that full-time role? I would have maybe tried to shadow or... Um, learn a little more from the sales people and marketing people. I think a lot of us who go out on our own are really good at what we do, right? Our subject matter expertise. Uh, but you know, the business of running the business, lead generation, sales, um, you know, the thought process between how, of how to structure these proposals, you know, there's a lot that really good business development people are as good at what they do as we are at what we do. And that's something I'm not sure how I would have done that <laughs> without being like, hey, I'm about to start my own business. Uh, can you teach me some things? But you're just trying to even see those templates, right? Can I, can I see that kind of stuff would, I think, have helped me a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We got another hand raised, Saba. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice for best practices with like bookkeeping and keeping up with taxes? Um, I, it's to hire a bookkeeper. <laughs> it's my best advice. It, that's really hard to do though. Um, and I mean, Raymond, jump in with this if you'd like. I am a little lax about well, taxes, I do pay my estimated taxes on time. I set reminders for myself um, as much as possible. I'll automate that at the beginning of the year. So like 
I don't know if you can do it at the IRS, but at the state level in Maryland, I can set those recurrent payments for all four estimated. What I don't do is really kind of calculate what should my estimated taxes be this quarter. I just sort of like send them some money. And if I made a lot of money that quarter, I send them a little more money. And if I didn't, then maybe I send them a little less money. And it all shakes out in April when their return comes back, right? Which again, the money people would have a heart attack because what that ends up meaning often is that the IRS gets an interest-free loan from me for um, a lot of money for a long time. And that's not the way you should do it, but I at least don't have tax penalties and things like that to deal with. So um, it's, it's not good. Uh, as far as keeping the books, I do use QuickBooks online. It is, a, I want to say $25 a month, which is kind of high, like for a one person organization. Uh, there's also a QuickBooks self-employed, which I think is less but it also is really hard to use. It's hard to navigate. It's hard to like sync up. I, I used it for a year and then I went to, Q, to QBO, QuickBooks Online. Um, there's also a free tool called Wave, which I liked a lot, um, but they're in Canada. So they use a, like a invoice-based accounting system versus a cash-based accounting system, which just, Supposedly, it's very easy to reconcile, but if you, for example, invoice a client on December 20th and they don't pay you till January 10th, then like it'll show up on your previous year, even though you didn't get paid. I, I always tell people it's very Canadian. They just trust that you're going to get paid if you sent this invoice, <laughs> which in America is not a guarantee at all, right? So uh, that's another option, especially if you're just kind of getting started and you want to keep track of the expenses, um, keep track of the income and expenses and have a really handy way to create those invoices, which I think are kind of the key things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Danielle, um, Raymond was talking a bit earlier about like the different tools that we kind of have access to. And you also mentioned like, you don't get tech support, obviously as a freelancer. How have you navigated that, like, in terms of, yeah, like, do you, I, I, I mean, I guess. Um, YouTube videos, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like one YouTube, but also like, in a way, like investing in yourself, investing in your business and how that obviously will in turn affect what you bill, bill your clients. But yeah, just not having enterprise level or enterprise wide tools and technology at your disposal. Disposal. How have you navigated that? Um, there are. I haven't had trouble finding solutions. I'll say that. Um, in in terms of running the business, like I said, QuickBooks Online is about twenty five dollars a month. I have a Zoom subscription, annual license at the lowest paid tier. Um, a lot of times you get away with the free versions, at least for a while, like, but Zoom cuts you off at 40 minutes, which is just not cool. Um, what else do I use for work things? I mean, Trello is great for sort of organizing your, your thoughts and to-dos. That's free. And I'm sure there's a paid tier there. I pay for Dropbox um, for extra storage there, which uh, kind of handles all of its backups. Um, web hosting is relatively inexpensive. And I mean, often I can straight up say like, you know, last, last fall I had to buy a new laptop and I, I use Macs. So I knew that a project I was working on was going to require some heavier processing than my like, then five or six year old Mac was going to be able to handle. And so it was very easy to do that math. I mean, even a MacBook at, 15 or $1,600 or whatever it was, I was like, okay. So then I get a $25,000 project if I invest this $1,500. Like the math is not hard when you get down to it. Uh, then there's some non-negotiables like I do carry business insurance. Many of my clients require that. Um, that it runs me about $1,000 a year. Um, but again, if, if I don't spend that $1,000, then the 
the many tens of thousands that I get from these clients don't come in. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. I do sometimes run into trouble with, you know, someone wants to use something that's really only enterprise wide and it's more research tools, right? So someone will. Yeah, that's what I was, I was curious about research tools a bit as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of them are now targeting the enterprise. Um, User Zoom only targets the enterprise, but there's alternatives, right? I'm, I use Optimal Workshop very often. They have uh, a monthly, first of all, you can buy study credits at Optimal for 99 bucks a piece, um, but you can also do a monthly and just shut it off at the end of the month. So again, that math becomes easy. I'm like, okay, I'm going to spend $200 for one month of Optimal Workshop so that I can have this $15,000 project. Um, and I do factor that in, right, to the bids, uh, or I will straight up tell the client, okay, there's a software license expense that we're going to have to itemize here and I just pass that cost right along to them. Um, it's just more, if I do enough of it, then I'll get an annual subscription and just consider that part of my operating overhead. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes clients have licenses for things. I just worked with a client. I used user testing, which again, only targets the enterprise and you have to buy at least two seats and, or for two years. And I just used their license for it. Good questions. I'm curious in a given year or like six month range, how much of your clientele or people that you've worked with or companies that you work with compared to just like totally new um, people or companies? That is a great question. So um, usually it's companies that I have worked with or it's people who I've worked with at a company who've moved to another company, right? So uh, I, in my consulting work, right, I worked with a lot of people and I've been doing this work for 23-ish years, depending on how you count. And so all those people have like been moving around and meeting other people and moving around and meeting other people. And so that's mostly where I do get my work from. I try to speak at conferences and um, publish here and there. I don't do enough of those things. Uh, every once in a while, someone will say, hey, you know, I heard you give this talk two years ago and now I'm at this company that has this problem and I think you can help us, right? Or I will hear about something kind of through the grapevine. Um, I'm working with a medical device startup right now where like, someone on my graduate program alumni page was looking for someone to help this person. And uh, it just kind of worked out that way. So um, lots of word of mouth. I, I know there's a class coming up on marketing and I'm actually gonna attend it uh, because I really don't have that sort of lead sales pipeline magic that a lot of other people have. And a lot of the small business advice is for B2C businesses, you know, how do you sell product X? How do you, uh, you know, do retail? How do you open your, or bring people into your mom and pop ice cream shop, right? Which is very different type of advertising and marketing than uh, B2B consulting. Awesome. So how many researchers in the house? Well, most yeah excellent i'd so, love to see it your comments are totally germane because this is the kind of work all of them oh that's right because it's the ux research guild i knew that i'm so sorry it's very late on the east coast okay <laughs> you're so helpful just coming on having been successful for 13 years sharing the things that have worked for you. If I have a final question, it's what do you think has made the biggest difference for you? Is it your Bentley degree? Is it all those clients consulting that kind of got you going? Like what factor, just 
out of curiosity, it could be different for other you know, people, but what seems to have just helped you time and time again? What has seemed to help me? I think I'm going to say the diversity of experience. And uh, I, I imagine you may have talked a little bit already about sort of how to differentiate yourself in, in the field um, and the marketplace. And it's sometimes it's really helpful to pick a vertical, like I'm all healthcare, I'm all automotive, I know fin FinTech, like the back of my hand. Um, but, you know, for me to say FedEx, MasterCard, Pfizer, Federal Reserve Bank, Hyundai, you know, it's uh, Electrolux, you know, um, I, I think it gives me a little bit of street cred. Uh, the masters gives me a little bit of street cred. And then I'm also going to say speaking because you, you can't come in like a mouse as an independent consultant, right? You have to be confident, uh, that you know what you're talking about, you know, that your, your client needs to be confident that they can count on you to do this work and that they don't have to handhold and that kind of thing. And I think just practicing having an opinion, you know, having a point of view on things and being willing to share it, hopefully in a clear and articulate way, uh, is really important. Great answer. Great, great answer. Well, what would you say, Raymond? I, <clears throat> what you said at the beginning of that answer, I think is most germane, which is the companies that you've worked for, that people, the respect people have for the companies you've worked for. So if you're launching and you've worked for some of those famous name brand companies, you just have an advantage over an equally skilled person but was laboring at less well-known companies because of credibility because of trust people want to trust your skill set and they don't have too many things to go by but that's a big one it is um i would say though if you don't have that don't let that hold you back because you'd be surprised at how quickly you can kind of rack up those logos on your website um i think that's a great great encouragement i appreciate mm -hmm. it danielle thank you so so much it's been awesome i see in the text something Let's yes see. thanks y'all and if you i will put my email address in here please feel free to write with any questions comments concerns one-offs i'm happy to share anything that i can um, I picked up a few things. That is so generous of you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Raymond. I'm going to hop off. You guys have, oh, can I share the company website? I'll share it, but it's broken. This is my shame of the last six months. No, that's not shame. That's saying that the website isn't how it happens. You just told us how it happens. It's your colleagues. It's former employers. It's that's there's an important message there. Nice, nice spin. I like it. <laughs> so yes, that's the company website, and I'll put um, LinkedIn up there too. But yeah, there's some stuff there. The homepage is broken, but you can nav to some things, and I'm you know happy to tell you what's supposed to be there if you want. But yeah, yeah. If anybody wants to help me with that, I'd love to <laughs> drop me a line. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, y'all. Have a great night.